the diaspora strategy. How do we here in the diaspora reach people more and more for Jesus? So there's something I call the catch strategy for diaspora ministry. And I want to, I want you to listen to me very carefully because I like what you know the man of God said last night that the purpose of God is His decision, but it's your discovery. You don't decide the purpose of God for your life; you only discover it, and it's your responsibility. To discover it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the honor of kings to search it out. So it's your responsibility to discover what God has already decided. And today I'll be talking to you about your place in the assignment and in the program of God. And I believe God will help you to catch this. Next slide. Please move quickly. Now, the U.S. military, I want to just start with it. The U.S. military did an analysis. And they now concluded that we live in what we call the VUCA war. Say with me, VUCA. Say it like you mean it. Say VUCA. They say we live in a VUCA world. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. This was the U.S. military's assessment of the world we live in right now. It's a volatile world filled with all kinds of uncertainties, filled with all kinds of complexities, and filled with all kinds of ambiguities. Next slide. And what our response is in a setting of volatility, we need to have vision. And last night we talked about vision. Thank you, Professor Vincent, about talking about that Genesis chapter 1 and drawing out that the first thing we need to consider is vision. So in a volatile situation, you need to think about vision. In a place of uncertainty, you need to have understanding. In the place of complexity, what you need is clarity to be able to see well. And in the place of ambiguity, what you need is agility or adaptability. The ability to reinvent yourself where you need to reinvent yourself because if you continue to do things the way you have been doing it before, you continue to have the outs outcomes that you've been having before. So, I want to address an issue. There's a, a passage of scripture that I find very fascinating. It's in Romans chapter 10. Please move very quickly with me. It's in Romans chapter 10. This passage of scripture is very striking. There are four questions in this passage of scripture. Please, next slide. Can you move with me very quickly? Romans chapter 10. There are four questions here. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We all know that. Whosoever, man, woman, boy, girl, black, white, rich, poor, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But look at verse 14. It begins to pose a question to us. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Number two question. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Number three question. How shall they hear without a preacher? Number four question. No, that's number four. Now, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And then number four question. How shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So I've been asked to show you some powerful things about how you can be relevant in God's agenda. How you can discover your place, stand your ground, find your assignment, fulfill your purpose. Ultimately, God wants you to find, God wants you to focus, God wants you to fulfill, and God wants you to finish your assignment. For me, my own personal definition of success Success is not prosperity. Success is not power. Success is not punditry to me. For me, success is finding, focusing, fulfilling, and finishing the assignment God has for me. Are you still here with me? Say with me, finding, focusing, fulfilling, and finishing. I didn't hear you say finding, focusing, fulfilling, and finishing the assignment of God for my life. When you stand before God, listen to me, every one of you. God is going to ask you two questions. Let me give you what we call an ESPO, advanced information. God is going to ask everybody here two X questions, two questions. Only two questions God is going to ask you. The first question God is going to ask you is the question of salvation. What did you do with Jesus? If you can answer that question, God will ask you the second question. What did you do with your life? That's the question of stewardship. Two questions. The question of salvation and the question of stewardship. If you are unable to answer the first question, he's not going to pose the second question. So the first question will be the question of salvation. What did you do with Jesus? And many of you have answered that question. But the next most important question is, what did you do with your life? That's the question of stewardship. So, 
I want to show you a graph very quickly. Next slide. Please walk with me. So, in terms of ministry, I see ministry as we reach out to people in the diaspora to consist of five M's. First of all, we have a mandate. God has commissioned us already. God has asked us to go and disciple the nations. That's a mandate. Then we need a message. It's an unchanging message. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forevermore. There's no other name given among men by which men can be saved except the name of Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The message is unchanging. Then you need the messenger. God deals with men. God gives men as gifts to carry the message. And then you need money. But what we need to tweak ever so often is to tweak the method. Say with me the method. So when you have the mandate, you have the message, you have the messenger, and you have the resources, the man of God talked about resources. You always have to tweak the method. So I want to show you how we can tweak the methods that our life becomes more effective. Next slide. So the question we want to answer tonight is, since cultures are different and contexts are not the same, how do we uniquely and intentionally reach people and minister to them in our local context? And this is what God's servant has asked me to address tonight. When I grew up, I don't know some of you, I was born in southeastern Nigeria and I grew up there. When we gave our lives to Christ and we began to walk with God and do stuff on campus, we used to do everything. We speak in buses, we speak early in the morning, they call it morning cry. In the classrooms, we do that. And also we do house-to-house -house visitation. How many of you know that in our context right now, you will not be the one that want to preach in the bus or in the train or in the plane? Is that not true? And if you're a black male particularly, you don't want to go knocking on people's doors with your Bible. I mean, I'm just looking at this gentleman. Just look at these two men. Can you just stand up these two gentlemen? Can you imagine these two people carrying Bibles and they come to your door? And they say they're coming for door-to-door -door evangelism. And you live in Texas. What do you think is going to happen to them? Before you know it, somebody's going to say, I felt threatened by these two men and I'm standing my ground. The law in Florida and Texas, if you're at home, you stand your ground. If somebody comes and you don't like the person, you call the person down and ask questions later. So the method has to change. Thank you so much. You can be seated. We cannot do things we have been doing before in other contexts. I've had the opportunity to live and work in five countries, Nigeria, Botswana, South Africa, Guyana, and here in the U.S. I've been here for 16 years now. And I know that contests matter. Cultures matter. You cannot just import something from somewhere and kind of translate it exactly that same way. So you have to find out, how does this work here? How can I be effective here? Listen to me, my dear brothers and sisters. You cannot succeed in an American society with an African mentality. Some of you are struggling because you want to succeed just imagine, for instance, you know, I deal with people all the time and sometimes I'm frustrated with people. I'm frustrated with people because they want to import a different context and a different mental and force it into somewhere. It's just like me traveling to the United Kingdom and I say, well, I'm, I, look, I drive on the right in the U.S., so I must drive on the right in the U.S. In London, I'm not going to use the pound. I have to use the dollar. It's the best currency. What's going to happen to me? I'm not going to fit into that society. If I'm driving on the wrong side of the road, I'm going to have an accident and kill somebody or kill myself. And I'm not able to spend the U.S. dollars, no matter how many I have, until I change it to pounds. You know why? I'm in a different culture. I'm in a, I'm in a different context. I need to be agile. I need to be adaptable. I need to understand the local context and local culture so that I can be successful. Some of you are struggling because you want to be Nigerians in America. That will not work for you. You want to minister in America like you're ministering in Africa. That will not work for you. There's a pastor. I'm going back. If I have time, I'll talk about it. I'm going back tomorrow, and I'm going to talk to him during the week. He used to have about 200, 250 members. His service times had a start time and no end time. He used to tell them that services end as the spirit. I'm sure you get what I mean. Services start at 7, evening services at 7 p.m. 1 a.m. that stay there. People will be, when well, you want to carry your Bible and go, you say, look, the devil is attacking you. The devil is against you. The church has gone from 200 and 250 to 20 people. And he says it's the devil. Is it the devil? 
a friend of mine said, every time the devil goes to God and says, they're accusing me of what I didn't do. <laughs> These people are accusing me of what I didn't do. Give me the next slide very quickly. I want to show you something very quickly. There's something I call the catch strategy. Say with me, catch. I didn't hear you. Shout, catch. See, next slide. C stands for conviction. Before you will be able to do what God wants you to do, impact the lives of people, you have to come from a place of conviction. What conviction? There are five convictions I want to give you. Please walk with me very quickly. Five convictions. I don't have time. Number one, you have to come to the conviction about the brevity and the singularity of life. Job 41. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. One of the favorite scriptures I have in my world is James chapter 4 verse 14. The Bible says in the B verse, it said the life of a man is like what? A vapor. I like the translation say that it's like a puff of smoke. And that translation says it's like a mist. Your life is like a mist, a puff of smoke. What are you going to do with that puff of smoke? Every time I've checked a vapor, I see a vapor disappears and I've never seen the vapor return again. And the Bible says, the life of a man is like a vapor. So number one conviction is that you need to understand about the brevity and the singularity. Life is singular. You have only one life to live. And there's no second opportunity, no second chance in life. Number two conviction you need to have is the length of eternity. Eternity is long. I showed you an infinity sign there. Eternity is long. Many years ago, I told people, I said, and listen to me, don't get confused by what I'm going to say. So I want you to pay attention. I said, if I had only a hundred years in hell, or even 500 years in hell, or a thousand years in hell, or even a million years in hell, and I don't want to go to heaven, I will opt to go to hell. You know why? Because it's a thousand years, one time is going to come to an end. Even a million years, sometime, it's a long, long time, but sometimes it's going to come to an end. When something is eternity, there's no end to it. Five minutes after you die, you will discover whether you made the right decision or not. And that will be too late for you to change your mind. The length of eternity compels me to speak to people about the, their soul. Number three conviction you need to have is the hopelessness of humanity. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, having no hope. We had no hope. Humanity is hopeless. Say with me, humanity is hopeless. My dear brothers and sisters, I knew a gentleman, if I call his name, many of you will know him. Popular comedian, acted in many movies. Had $38 million in cash. Some of us, we never see that amount of money all our life. Had been married about three or four times. Had many beautiful women. Very popular. Came to his house, drew the curtains around his house. Black for 18 hours. Went down to his basement and hung himself with his belt. Left $38 million cash in his account. And took his life with his belt. Humanity is hopeless without God. I want to show you some data that is striking. Give me the next slide. I saw this. This is so powerful. I see every person is hopeless, helpless, and helpless without God. Do you know that there are 37 million Americans on antidepressants? Please look up here. Let me show you something. Even if I stop here, let me show you something. The U.S. right now is at the height of its greatest prosperity. Don't mind the um, recession we're having right now. The GDP of this country is $105 trillion. Many of you are making the most money you have ever made in your life. The country is at the height of its prosperity. Yet 45,000 people commit suicide in this country every year. They put a gun in their, and blow their brains out. Or, put, or they take poison or they cut their wrist or they just kill themselves. We have 260 million painkillers prescriptions in this country. The U.S. is just 5% of the world's population. But they consume 30% of antidepressants in the world and 80% of painkillers. Can I ask you something? At the height of the greatest prosperity of this country ever in history, 45,000 people are killing themselves. 260 million painkillers. 
There are just 5% of the world's population. They consume almost one third of all the antidepressants being taken in this country. One in four adults is almost an antidepressant. If you're four in a row, one of you is chronically depressed. If you're four, I'm sure somebody is looking around. <laughs> Who is the person? Is it me? <laughs> is it me? <laughs> I tell you, this is serious. Conviction number four. Let's go very quickly, please. Conviction number four. The value of the woman's soul. What shall it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his soul, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Look at the US. 105 trillion, trillion, almost 30% of the global GDP. Some of you are looking for Nigeria. You're not going to find it there. The government has eaten the money. But the point I'm trying to make is the value of the human soul. The Bible says, what shall you profit about? So if you gain the whole world, everything you see there, and you lose your soul, God says you've made a big loss. Your soul is more valuable than the entire GDP, than the entire world. That's God's assessment of how important you are. Then the final conviction that makes me do this is the price of man's redemption. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. But with the precious, how were we redeemed? With the precious blood of Jesus. Say with me the precious blood of Jesus. I didn't hear you shout the precious blood of Jesus. As 2028, 20, I like this. Take it therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now listen to this. To feed the flock of God which he had purchased with his own blood. God's blood purchased you. So which he has purchased with his own blood. How do you know the value of a thing? You know the value of a thing by the price paid for it. If I go to this parking lot now, there may be 100 cars in this parking lot. How do I know the most valuable car in the parking lot? The most valuable car in the parking lot may not necessarily be the biggest car or the smallest car or the fanciest car. If you want to know the most valuable car in the parking lot, you ask for the price tag. The price of a thing gives you an idea of its value. Or the picture here, this is the most expensive car in the world. Bugatti La Vontrenor. Only 10 will be made. Only one is made in the whole world right now. This is $19 million. You don't buy it with a car note. <laughs> When I was looking at this car, I saw YouTube, I saw this car. I said, hey, what if you rear-end this car? You go to the freeway and you rear-end this car. In fact, come out of the car, start one. <laughs> start one. If you call your insurance company, hi, insurance company, say, yes, what happened? You say, I rear-ended a Bugatti La Vontrenor. They will change their phone number. <laughs> $19 million. The insurance company will go broke. How are they going to pay for this? And you see, what makes it exclusive? There are only 10. They will make only 10. Only one is right now has been made. And it's been driven by Cristiano Ronaldo. He's the one who drives. This is the Bugatti. So if this car is in the parking lot, this car can almost buy all the cars in the parking lot right now. The point I'm trying to make is that you know the value of a thing by the price. An idea of the price gives you an idea of value. Your value is so... That's why I tell people, if you're too tall, if you're taller than me, you're too tall. If you're shorter than me, you're too short. If you're fatter than me, you're too fat. If you're taller than me, you're too thin. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Look, I seem I'm, I'm a victim. I'm not a victim. I'm, I'm first among equals. I'm the head and not the tail. I, 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 no man can put me down. Because I realize that I'm so valuable... That God surrendered the life of his only begotten son to have a relationship with me. Doesn't that make you feel good? God allowed his son to be killed just because of me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's go back with the So catch. Catch. Number two is the A. And we're going to move very quickly. Please help me. Adaptability. Say with me adaptability. I didn't hear say Adaptability. Let's move quickly. Next slide. Help me, help me. Three, four eyes I want to show you in adaptability. As we do diaspora ministry, what I call incarnational ministry. 
You know, Jesus became flesh. The world became flesh and dwelt amongst us. In Philippians chapter 2, he said, he took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. You need to adapt. Look up here, everybody. Oh, God, help me tonight. Many of you, as I'm speaking to you tonight, originally came from Africa, from the Caribbean, or African-Americans and so on. And many of you are economic immigrants. You didn't come to this country to pastor. You didn't come to this country to serve God. You came to make money. I tell yourself the truth. You came to go to school. Well, let's be honest. To go to school to acquire more skills or to find work. How many of you? Yeah? How many of you came to this country to go to school? Let me see your hand. Or you came to this country to work. Some of you, you didn't come to go to school. You didn't come to work. <laughs> you just found yourself here. I was in Nigeria. I finished a, a meeting. Uh, a pastor ran after me. He had four passports in his hand. He said, man of God, pray for me. God has called me to start a church in Miami, Florida. I said, Miami? He said, what's this? He said, myself, my wife, my two kids. He said, lay hands on this passport. I said, wow, that's great. I said, how did you know you're supposed to go to Miami? See, the, the name sounds nice, Miami. <laughs> and I said to him, I said to him, have you heard of Cincinnati? He said, that one sounds nice as well. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, so what are you, who are you pastoring? How many people are you pastoring? What are you doing? He said, I'm not doing anything now. I'm waiting till I get to Miami. You can't be a lizard in Nigeria and be an alligator in America. So the first thing you need to do, incarnational ministry. When you go somewhere, you have to understand the way people there think. You have to understand the culture. You have to understand the, co the context. If you come with baggage from where you came from, that baggage will kill you. Because the difference between success and failure when you're in a new territory is information and adaptability. So number one is incarnational ministry. You have to learn to think and be like the people so that you can be able to reach them. Jesus became like us in order to be able to um, reach us. Number two is innovation. Paul said this. I love this. First Corinthians 9.20. Unto the Jews I became a Jew that I may gain to the Jews. To them that were under the law as under the law that I may gain them that were under the law. To them that are without the law. I became a somebody without the law. That I might gain them that are without the law. Verse 22. To the weak, I became as weak. That I may gain the weak. I am made all things to all men. That I, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for what? This I do for what? I didn't hear. This I do for what? So we have to innovate. We have to do things differently. You cannot go to the morning cry. You cannot do the boss. You cannot knock on people's doors like we used to. Do you know I've even noticed, I've been in this country for 16 years now. The kind of when Hamburg type of crusades that used to happen in Africa don't happen here anymore. The tent meetings of Kenny Hagen and all our whole boss tent meetings of the 60s and 70s don't happen here. There was a big, I don't want to call his name. There's a very popular preacher in this country that does stadium, big stadium meetings. Came to Washington, D.C., and they were selling tickets for $25 per person to allow you to come into the crusade. So I called the number. I said, look, I see there's a big meeting coming. He said, yes. Are you ready with your $25? I said, no. So I said, what if I want to hear the gospel? Can I come? They said, no. You have to pay $25 to enter the stadium. So here's the point I'm trying to make is the, the things we are used to in the past is not the way it is right now. Things have changed right now. And we need to be agile and adaptable. I like what God's servant said yesterday. So that thing hit me like a tornado. You said, we've gone through COVID. A transformational experience. And came out. But we still want to live as if nothing happened. Something happened. And it's not business as usual. So we have to innovate. We have to bring creativity into inactivity. We have to do things differently. You cannot solve a problem with the same level of thinking that created it. So you have to do, then number three, I, very quickly, you have to have integrity. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 20. For we take thought beforehand and aim to be honest and absolutely above suspicion. Not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. Integrity gives you real freedom because you have nothing to fear. I tell my kids all the time, tell the truth. Because if you don't tell the truth, how many of you know that if you tell a lie, you have to tell another lie? First of all, if you tell a lie, you have to remember the lie you told. Because if you don't remember the lie you told, you'll be in trouble because next time you're going to tell a different lie that doesn't align with the previous lie. So if you tell a lie, you have to, number one, remember the lie. Number two, you have to tell another lie to support that lie. And then you have to tell another lie to support the lie that is supporting the other lie. And then another lie to support the lie that is supporting the lie that is supporting the lie. Before you know it, your life is a wreck. Integrity is important because people should know you for who you are. Your reputation is not your integrity. Your reputation is what people think about you. Your integrity is who you are. Your character is who you are. Who you are in the dark. Who you are alone. Who you are when nobody's watching. I spoke to a pastor friend of mine. He walked into the house of... <coughs> um, first of all, he went to do a housewarming for a member, an elder in his church. And they gathered the church. He is Lord. The worship was so powerful. He is Lord. Amen. And they finished everything. He blessed the house. And they said, Pastor, God bless you. What a wonderful opportunity. He left. On his way, Away, 15 minutes drive away. He remembered he forgot his house key in the house that he just dedicated. He didn't call. He made a U-turn and went back to the house and opened the door. Oh, then the music had changed. He saw almost half-naked people. The mark, the kind of crazy music. People were. 15 minutes later. And the pastor gave me 15. This was 15 minutes ago. <laughs> he forgot his key, came back. The, the, the music they were playing was rotten music. The, the, if you see the. <laughs> 15 minutes! Adaptability, please, let's go quickly. Inner Fertney, this is a big one for me. Please listen to me. Inner felt needs. Please, listen to what I'm going to tell you to save your life and marriage. I had the experience when I had seen couples, Ghanaians, Cameroonians, Nigerians, and so on, married five years, eight years, ten years in Africa. Come into the U.S. six months later, they come into the office looking for a divorce. So I asked them, why are you coming for, you've been married 10 years, 12 years, 8 years, 6 months, you're staying in this country, you're looking for divorce. It occurred to me, and I'm not trying to impinge on anybody, that sometimes what we do in Africa, for those of you who come in Africa, is welfare prayer. When they are praying and fasting, one day I saw somebody, I visited Nigeria, I saw somebody, the neck was like this. The neck was really... I said, my friend, what is happening? He said, he's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights for U.S. visa. 40 days and 40 nights for U.S. visa. The neck was like this. And I said to myself, I said to myself, no, you're laughing, but this is serious. <laughs> so it's, well, it's welfare, food, security, water, light. Na, 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 na. When we now come here, you can walk into Walmart, buy a gun, buy bullets, one dollar each, and pack up. You can get food. You can get a car note and pay over seven years. If you have a steady job, you can get a mortgage and buy a house. Is that not true? All of a sudden, their motivation for fasting and prayer goes away. And all their life is God. Give me, give me. Just for the man of God, give me. Give me. Here, yeah, when you're sick, I don't know here, when you're sick, call the ambulance. Three minutes later, the ambulance is in your house. They take you to the hospital. Some places where you come from, there's no ambulance in the first place. <laughs> so nothing is coming. <laughs> Even you, when you go to the hospital, you have to put money down before you get payment. I was a doctor in Nigeria. The first patient that died in my hands 
chronic renal failure. There was no dialysis machine in the hospital. I was a house officer at the University of Port Harcourt Teaching Hospital. I led the man to Christ and watched him die slowly. When he was dying, his younger brothers and his wife were fighting over his property. Last five days of his death, they never came to see him. So, people have inner felt needs. If you're going to succeed here, you're not just going to tell people prosperity, prosperity. Receive a lot. Which a lot are they going to receive? Because, you know, it's a bit different. The reason is because the situation here has changed. If somebody is wealthy and rich, what, what are you telling the person? I have friends who make a lot of money who can write checks of $150,000 right now. So you're not going to come to him. Their houses are paid off. They have legacy money. They have farms in Florida, beach homes in Vermont. So what are you going to tell them? Tell them to lift up their phone and get an alert? That's not going to work for them. Most of them, their biggest problem is something emotional. Next slide. Number one is fear. I spoke to Pastor Sam Ousu. Pastor Sam Ousu is pastoring. This church is in the Guinness Book of Record. I've been there many times. He's come to preach in our church a number of times. There are 110 nationalities in his church. I spent eight days with him in Vancouver, in Canada. I asked Pastor Sam, you're from Ghana. Your church is 50% Caucasian, 30% Asian. The, the other ones are African. The church is so diverse. 110 nations. I saw that real time. And I said, how are you doing this? How are you able to reach people across 110 nations? Their needs are different. Their background is different. Their culture is different. Their context is different. He said something to me. He said, I come to them from there. You see, all of them have fear in their life. They have depression. They have worry and anxiety and rejection and fear. In Canada, everybody has health care. So you're not going to say, um, let's pray for health care. They can just call their GP, call their doctor and be in the hospital. I get a CT scan, MRI and get things done. So it begins to deal with the fear and deal with the rejection and deal with the shame and deal with the depression. And he has 2,500 people there. So we have to learn not just to deal with people's basic needs and so on. To begin to speak to purpose. People want to know why am I here? Why am I alive? What is the purpose of my life? What is my assignment? Why was I born when I was born? May 9, 6 a.m. Saturday morning, 1970. Oh, I, oh, I shouldn't have told you my age. Oh my God. But the point is that I wasn't born in 1716 or 1823 or 1912. I was born when I was born at the right time because there's a purpose, there's an assignment with my name on it. And if I live and die without fulfilling that assignment, I've lived a wasted life. Adaptability. Say adaptability. Next slide, quickly. I've learned another way to reach to people here is take advantage of their, of their vulnerable times and seasons. At the time of dislocation or the time of relocation or the time of isolation or the time of desolation, People are very open to the gospel. We have moved to a new neighborhood. They've had some bereavement. They've had challenges in their life. They are more open to hearing the gospel. And so we try to reach people who have recently relocated. They are trying to find friends in a new place. People have been dislocated. We have had issues in their life. You know, marriages are crumbling. We have a marriage ministry and so on and so on. At that point in their life, they are willing to give their life to Christ. I've had couples come to my office and say, I'm about to lose everything. My marriage is on the rocks right now. And I need God. And anything you tell them to do, they're willing to do it at that point. And that's a point to begin to reach out to them. Number two thing about timing is that in this country, please be sensitive to times in service. Be sensitive to times in service. Sometimes people have to go to work. People have to go to work. And there are nurses, there are doctors, they have to be at work. You don't have a start time in service and you don't have an end time. Now, you can have a hybrid system where you can have 90-minute services, two-hour services, and then you can have open services where there's no end time. Like what Pastor Sam always does, and I learned this from him. His Friday night, his prayer meeting is the most attended prayer meeting I've ever seen. Sometimes the prayer meeting is more attended on Friday than even on Sunday. And what he does is the prayer meeting is from 7 to 9. Two-hour prayer meeting. That church prays. After 9... May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy God bless you. If you want to go, go. We are entering extreme prayer time with no time at end. No end time. So people who want to go just carry their Bible happily. The service is over. They go home. Those radicals, 
those dangerous people that want to stay back. We stay back and they can stay there till 11, 12. He's the, he's one of the pastors is always the last to leave. You pray till you're tired. If there's somebody praying, the pastor stays there, not the main pastor, one of the, the prayer pastors. So they have these hybrid services where they allow a specific closing time so people can go. They have families. But at the same time, you're open to other people who may have extra time and they want to linger in the presence of God. Because sometimes God is not in a hurry. I used to hear with me. Sometimes you need to linger. You, know, you need to stay a while. You, you need to, many of you who have worked with God know that you don't just jump into the presence of God. Say, hi God, how are you doing today? You know, <laughs> sometimes you need to stay in the presence of God and linger in the presence of God. And you can use hybrid services to solve that problem. Quickly, next one. I'm about community. Just one more, I will let you go. Say with me, community. Next slide. So, this is an important thing. Learn to accept and value people in community. You know, sometimes we talk about John 3.16, we forget about John 3.17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Learn to value people. Learn to remember people's names. The most beautiful sound in the ears of somebody is the sound of their name. Learn to value people. I've noticed that when you value people, even when you disagree with them, do you know that you can love somebody and still not approve of their behavior? God loved us even though he didn't approve of our behavior. While we were yet sinners, God commended his love towards us and said Jesus to that. So you can love and approve and it's not the same. You can love your children without approving of their behavior. So learn to value people. When you value people, you draw people and give them an opportunity to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. To build community, number two. Learn to differentiate from online ministry. How many of you have noticed that look at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, every great preacher in this country is online. And do you know that your, the members of our churches, they have options to choose. In fact, somebody can stay on their basement and with their phone, listen to Jesse Franklin, listen to T.D. Jakes, listen to Robert Morris, listen to everybody at the same time. Is that not true? So, some of us who are local pastors now are trying to minister at the same time when others, I know one of them, Robert Morris used to have about 250,000 people listening to him on Sunday morning. And so, the thing is that so you, we must be able to offer people something that they cannot get online. And that's that personal touch. I tell people, I say, iron sharpens iron. For iron to sharpen iron, there has to be proximity. And iron in California will never sharpen an iron in Georgia. There has to be proximity. Genuine discipleship, genuine mentorship, genuine sharpening must occur in the context of proximity. Jesus called his disciples to be with him. There has to be that possibility. So you have to learn to differentiate from online ministry. So even if your members are listening to things online, they should also be able to receive something that they cannot receive online. Somebody told me, oh, I listen to this man of God online. I've been following him online. I did that. He's my pastor. I said, no, he can't be your pastor. I said, the last time you were sick, did he call you? Did he visit you in the hospital? He said, hey, that's true. He didn't call me. He doesn't even know I'm here. I can listen to him, but... I, you have to find a, a community of believers to belong to. Life, listen, don't be, don't run your life in isolation. Isolation leads to desolation. If you watch geographic channels, lions and predators, they look for isolated animals. They don't attack animals in a bunch. Sometimes even if they attack in a bunch, they isolate one. When the enemy isolates you, he can desolate you. Next slide. Make disciples, not members. That's the instruction. You go, go therefore and do what? Make disciples. I don't want members in, my, in our church. I want disciples. The difference between a member and a disciple is commitment. When we are starting the church, I was talking to one of my brothers. I said, where are you? I'm looking for say, pastor, I'm coming. And he was on 95 North going to New York. I live in Maryland. He was going to where? New York. He said, pastor, we are coming. You know, we are, we are coming. Can you imagine somebody, it's just like somebody heading north and telling him he's, he's coming south. He never showed up. That's not commitment. So you need people who are committed. Every pastor will tell you the greatest need in the ministry is committed people who take initiative. 
Not we Bible Christians. Wherever you leave them, that's where they remain till next week. And you come and push them. They remain here. Then you come and push them. They remain here. They, they are self-feeders. That's a sign of maturity. When your child cannot feed itself, that child needs to see a pediatrician. If it's of age. So make disciples, devoted disciples, committed people. And then finally, I think the H is hospitality. I will end the hospitality. Say with me, hospitality. Just before we started our church a couple of years ago, our church is still very young. They did a study. I watched the largest study done in, and this is squeeze, I'm, I'm ending here. The largest study they did in this country to ask people a simple question. Why do you not go to church? There were many reasons people gave. There were four top reasons in the United States, a representative study done. Why people don't want to go to church. Please, who can tell me the top four reasons? Somebody just has a guess. Top four reasons why people in America, I'm not talking about believers now and church hopping. I'm talking about it's a representative population of everybody. Top four reasons why they don't want to go to church. Top four. Huh? I can't hear you. Mm. <laughs> Say that again. They can talk to God for themselves. Well, that was one of the reasons, but not the top four. Top four reasons. Because you need to know why people are not coming to church to help them to come to church. That makes sense. Top four reasons. Church hot is there, but not top four. Top four. They are not friendly. I gave you the secret now. That one of the number three is that churches are not friendly. Do you know, I tried this out just before we started our church. I visited, I visited three churches and walked into three churches as a new person. All newcomers, immediately after the service, everybody was greeting themselves. Hi! Ah, Kelly, what are you doing? <laughs> they ignored me. Ignored me. Three churches, same experience. I was alone waiting for somebody to come and say hi. They did the initial welcome. Everybody was fellowshipping among them. Said, hi, how are you? Sister Stephanie, brother Stephen, sister James. And they were all there. And they left me, three different churches, isolated. So I came back to our church and made the 10-minute rule. 10 minutes after each service, none of my leaders should talk to each other. Find a person you don't know, a new face. Find somebody. Ask them their name. What's your name? Where are you from? Do you live in this neighborhood? This is my name. Find, because you already see each other all the time. And so, you know, some people come to church just to socialize on Sunday. I'm telling you. So, as I made the 10 minute rule, I don't want to see you talking to, and don't talk to me. Don't come to me. Because I'm trying to deal with new people. We can have an appointment and later I can see. But let me attend to new people and make friends with them. Be a friendly church. Be a place where anybody that walks in here, two or three people are lining up to introduce themselves to the person. Say, I like your hairstyle. Where did you do it? Where are you? Do you live in this neighborhood? Can I buy you lunch? Try and be a friendly church. Many churches are not friendly. They fellowship among, they think they are friendly because they know each other. They are not friendly to outsiders. Are you still here? Hospitality, number two. Love and care. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Theodore Roosevelt, he was a former U.S. president. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They have options. They have options. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Learn to express care and love for somebody. Learn to, one of our sisters, she, she sent me a text this week. She lost her mom. The way the church flooded her with love. She used the word, I told her not to use that kind of word again. She said, we wanted to use love to kill her. All her life, she's never seen this expression of love. And she said, look, God sent me here. People don't care how much you know. You can have four PhDs, two DSCs. You do 11 postdoc. It doesn't matter. If you don't care about people, you don't love people, you don't connect with people, you will never impact their life permanently. So learn to show hospitality. And sometimes we don't show hospitality towards ourselves. I've seen men open the door at Walmart for a strange lady. Hi, how 
wife, they open the door for a strange lady and woman and bang the door in the face of their own wife. You treat a stranger you've never met before better than your own wife. Lastly, I think I have one more slide to go and I'm out of here. So this is the catch strategy. My dear brothers and sisters, every one of us has a place in the plan of God. You're not here by accident. You're not an accident waiting to happen. There's a reason why you're here at this point in time. There's a reason why God brought you to Georgia. There's a reason why you're in this conference. There's a reason why you're saved, you're called, you're anointed. There's a reason why you're doing what you're doing right now. And God wants you to find the place. The heartbeat of God is souls. God loves people. Jesus died for people. God wants to see people change, transformed, and discipled. And God has brought you in at a time like this. And God wants to use multiple platforms. I'm not here. I can't tell you all my story because of time. God wants to use all multiple platforms. Whatever you have is an asset in the kingdom that can be used to impact the lives of people. There are people who have come to me for mentorship, for work, career-related mentorship. And I told them, I said, if somebody came to me and said to me, how did you get to where you got to in your career? I said, if I tell you, will you do it? He said, yes. I said, first of all, you have to give your life to Christ. Just that. I said, I'm not asking you to give your life to Christ just because you have to want to have breakthrough in your career. Because it will affect every area. He gave his life to Christ. He's an anointed minister of the gospel today. Came to me not looking for Jesus, looking for something else. I used to hear. So use whatever God has placed upon your heart. Use whatever God has placed upon your life. To enhance the kingdom of God and push it forward. In the name of Jesus. Can we stand up and pray? <laughs> say with me, catch. I didn't hear you say catch. Just lift up your hands, everyone. There's an assignment with your name on it. There's purpose in your life. There's meaning in your life. You are not an accident waiting for somewhere to happen. You were born when you were born in the family. You were born at the time you were born for a time like this. Lift up your hands and just receive grace right now. To stand in your place, in your own anointing. To stand where God wants you to stand. And to be a blessing. Everything God has brought into your life is to make you who you are. You can reach people I cannot reach. You can touch people I cannot touch. You can even touch people Pastor David cannot touch or reach. Everyone has his own place. Everyone has his own place. Stand your ground and your place. Lift up your hands and receive grace right now. Father, we thank you for grace tonight. We receive grace here tonight. We receive grace to, to find our assignment, to focus on our assignment, to fulfill our assignment and to finish it. We receive grace, oh God. Your heart beat his souls. To bring men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you because you're a good God. Everything we are, everything we have, everything we can do is because of your grace. We surrender ourselves to you right now. Blessed be your name of God. We receive right now. We receive right now. Just talk to God. Just 30 seconds and I'm done. Talk to God. Say, God, do something in my life. Use this conference to challenge me forward. Use this conference and place a new anointing, a new grace, a new mandate, a new vision. A new audacity in my bones. Talk to God. Say, God, I want to stand today. I want to be all I was born to be. Do all I was born to do. Have all I was born to have for your glory and for your honor. Thank you, Jesus. We give you the glory. In Jesus' precious name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the God of heaven be gracious towards you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord give you peace and prosperity all the days of your life. Say with me, I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. The hand of God is upon my life. The grace of God is upon my life. In this dark world, I have the light of life. In this confused world, I have divine direction. In this upside down world, I am right side up because the hand of God is upon my life. Glory to God.